Music team, thank you so much for that. <clears throat> and uh, by the way, they, uh, I would like to recognize another group of people that uh, don't get seen as much, except when everybody turns around when something goes wrong. But let's leave it, give a hand to all our sound booth people. They keep the lights in order. They do the sound. They're doing the video. And uh, this service just would not be the same without them. So thank you guys for all your efforts. Well, good morning to everyone that's gathered with us and anyone that might be uh, watching online. Thank you guys for being here, for joining us, for tuning in. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Slade Reinhardt. I'm the director of our Connect and Grow Ministries here at the church. And uh, it's my privilege to bring God's word to you today. We are continuing our sermon series going through the book of Romans called Live by Faith. So if you want to turn in your Bibles, you can go ahead and do that now. We'll be in Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 13. And by the way, video people, am I at the right distance from the camera? Am I good? Okay. I didn't need to move around any. Good. <clears throat> As, uh, as is my want, I'm going to start with a little history lesson. The pyramids of Giza in Egypt are counted as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And uh, they were actually completed. This is amazing. I, I guess I hadn't realized this until I was looking this up uh, this very morning. They were actually completed 25 centuries before Jesus was born. 25 centuries before Jesus was born. To kind of put that in perspective, these pyramids were finished closer in time. Now, let's see. How does that work? Let me back up. Okay. You guys have all heard of Cleopatra. Cleopatra lived closer in time to us today than she did to the completion of the pyramids. That would give you a little perspective on just how ancient these things are. The Great Pyramid, which is the largest of the three, is built of 2.3 million stone blocks and weighs over 5 million tons. It is an absolute masterpiece of engineering. The pyramid is almost exactly aligned with true north, and the level of the 13-acre base only varies by one inch. The outer stones fit together so well that you can't even fit a knife, ble knife blade between them. <clears throat> Now, the precision and the technical skill of the pyramids, combined with their extremely ancient age, has caused an alarming question to arise in the minds of some people. <clears throat> it's a question that if it was answered in the affirmative, would change everything that we know about the universe and about reality. It would unsettle everything that we know. The question is this. Were aliens involved in building the pyramids? <laughs> now, I realize that uh, most rational people do not seriously entertain that possibility. And uh, over time, we've actually been able to come up with a number of different methods by which the Egyptians, using the technology at that time, could have accomplished this. Uh, so aliens are off the table for those of you who are still hoping. But just for a second, put yourself in the place of someone who was seriously entertaining that. Because, again, if, if you answered yes to that question, that extraterrestrials had intervened, were existed, first of all, and then had intervened into our world and helped to build these pyramids, it would change everything that you think you know about history. The reason I... Paul answers an alarming question that, if it was answered in the affirmative, would unsettle everything that we think we know about reality and the universe. In the verses right before chapter 9, Paul victoriously announced that nothing is able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. <clears throat> if you are in Christ, if you are united to him by trusting in him, you cannot be taken away from God's family. And now Paul turns his attention to the Israelites because their present spiritual condition, and I'm saying present then, but it would apply now as well. Their present spiritual condition brings up an alarming question, a question that could undermine what Paul just said about our security in Christ. 
The question is this, did God fail? Did God fail? If you answer yes to that question, then everything you believe about the faith. Paul, you said nothing could separate us from his love, but isn't Israel separated from his love? Isn't it true that God chose Israel? Isn't it true that he made them his people? Isn't it true that they rejected his Messiah and that they are now cut off from God? How can I be sure that that won't happen to me? God chose me and made me one of his people. What if God is not able to keep me? What if he loses me like he lost Israel? What if I go astray and eventually reject Christ? Did God fail? If God failed, our salvation is in jeopardy. If God failed, his promises aren't sure. If God failed, our hope cannot be firm. And I'll say this now. I'll give you a spoiler just so you know where I'm going. The answer is no. In case you check out halfway through the sermon, I want you to know this up front. No, absolutely not. God did not fail. So let's see how Paul sets up the question and how he answers it. The passage begins by telling us that Israel is loved by Paul. Israel is loved by Paul. Paul is an Israelite. He was a natural-born Jew of the tribe of Benjamin. But he has put his faith in Jesus as the Messiah. He's turned from pursuing his own righteousness through his behavior and good deeds and now trusting in the righteousness of Christ. And that separates him from most other Jews. His bold criticism of the Jews' rejection of Christ and their legalistic tendencies could be taken as hostility toward his fellow kinsmen or bitterness. When he was on his first missionary journey, as you will remember, typically it was fellow Jews that were causing him the most trouble, that were stirring up, stirring up opposition against him and even threatening his life. But Paul wants to make sure right at the outset that he is not bitter or hostile or angry toward his people. He still loves them. Look at verses 1 through 3. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. And I have great sorrow, excuse me, that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. As Paul turns to the issue of Israel's separation from God, he could have started out by pointing out that the reason they're separated is because they have rejected the Messiah. They have rejected the salvation that God has freely offered to them. But instead, he started out by proclaiming his burden and his love for his unbelieving kinsmen. Paul's rebukes of the beliefs of other Jews is not motivated by hostility or anger toward them. And to underscore his sincerity, Paul brings in Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit as witnesses to the reality of this loving burden that he has for his kinsmen. I'm speaking the truth in Christ. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. And he says he has great sorrow and unceasing anguish in his heart. Paul had a burden, a very heavy, painful, deep, consistent burden. And what was that burden for? For his brothers, his kinsmen, according to the flesh, his fellow Jews. Paul wants us to know that the problem of Israel's rejection of God, and as a result their present spiritual state of apostasy, is not an academic question for him. It is real and keenly felt by a man who desperately and strongly continues to love his fellow Jews. These are his kinsmen, his fellow countrymen, and the bond between them is similar to the bond we would feel with our fellow Americans, but much, much stronger than that. More like the bond we feel for our fellow Texans. I'm kidding for all you non-Texans out there. We love you too. Because in, in uh, Paul's case, Israel was bound together not only by an ethnic identity and not only by a common country, but a common religion, a common worship, a common faith. So his, his connection to his fellow Israelites was far stronger than the average connection between countrymen. And so he says, if possible, I know it is not possible, if possible, I salvation, if it meant the salvation of my fellow Jews. I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off for, from Christ for the sake of my brothers. Of course, he's speaking in hyperbole, he's exaggerating effect. He's not really saying that he'd be willing to reject Christ uh, 
in order for his fellow Jews to receive Christ. But he's giving us a picture for how deeply and keenly he feels the pain of wanting to see the Jewish people turn to Christ. He's saying that he loves them and wants their salvation as much or more than he wants anything else in life. It's the same emotion that Moses expressed in Exodus 32 when after the incident with the golden calf, God told Moses, okay, we're going to wipe these guys out. I'm going to start a new nation with you, Moses. Let's get rid of these people. And Moses said, Lord, please forgive their sin, but if not, blot me out of your book. Paul is burdened for the salvation of the Jews so deeply that he could wish, that he could almost wish to be damned in order to see them saved. Now, do you see how Paul reflects the heart of God here? Paul doesn't despise Israel even though they've rejected the Messiah. He doesn't despise them even though they dishonor Christ and blaspheme his good name. He loves them still and wants to see them brought into the family of God. And isn't that how any true believer should relate to other believers? In Matthew 23, 37, Jesus himself said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you would not. Despite their rejection, Jesus still loved Israel. That is God's attitude toward the lost and it should be ours as well. We can and should hate evil, but we should continue to love those who are separated from Christ. If your cousin is constantly spouting anger and hatred and blasphemy toward God, don't give in to the ungodly attitude of hostility or bitterness to him. Pray for him. Continue to show him the love of God. Ask the Lord's heart for your cousin's soul. Even though they had largely rejected Christ, Israel is loved by Paul and by extension Loved by God. So after telling us how he feels about Israel, he sets up the question of God's failure by reminding us that Israel was chosen and blessed by God. The question of God's failure only comes up if God had indeed given Israel blessings or advantages or favor that he gave to no other people. And of course, he did. Paul confirms that to be true. He's about to list eight marvelous blessings, unique blessings that God gave to Israel and to no other people. And this is sort of like a jet tour Old Testament and a summary of Israel's spiritual heritage. Look with me at verses 4 and 5. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all. Blessed forever. Amen. So let's look for just a second of these different terms that uh, Paul lists here. The adoption refers to God's adoption of the nation of Israel as his son. In Exodus 4.22, God said, Israel is my son, my firstborn. In Hosea 11.1, 1, God said, when Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. Israel was adopted by God. The glory refers to God's glory that was displayed to Israel. For one thing, there was God's visible presence that was with the Israelites when they were delivered from Egypt. He traveled with them in the form of a pillar of cloud during the day and a pillar of fire by night. There was God's glory that was displayed in smoke and fire on Mount Sinai as he was about to hand the law down to them. And there were many visible expressions of his presence throughout their history. For instance, the glory cloud that filled the first temple after Solomon had dedicated it and brought the ark into it. To them belong the glory. To them belong the covenants. That refers to the covenants that God made with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, and David. All of these covenants that God made with man were made with Israelite men. Starting with Abraham, of course, the first Israelite, the father of their people. To them belongs the giving of the law. It was through Moses, an Israelite, that God gave his law, and it was first given to the nation of Israel. To them belongs the worship. This is talking about the system that God set up for worshiping him proper, properly. The Levitical priesthood, the sacrifices, the uh, ceremonies of the tabernacle, and later the temple. These were given to Israel to show how he was to be approached, now he was to be related to. And all the nations on the earth were to look to that to see how they could approach God. <clears throat> the last thing he mentions in verse 4 is the promises. 
Throughout the Old Testament, God gave promise after promise to Israel, most notably the promise of the coming Messiah. And these promises were always delivered directly to Israel and not any other people. And then Paul adds two more blessings that were more than things, they were people. He says, to them belong the patriarchs. Think about the founders of the faith of the one true God, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, most especially. These are men that were direct, directly visited by God to receive his promises and his covenants. They were the founders and shapers of the faith of the people of God, as well as the people of Israel. And they all belong to Israel. All of the people of Israel are descended from these men. And then on top of that, on top of everything, the absolute crowning blessing, the Messiah was born an Israelite. Jesus was born a Jew. A British journalist from years past wrote a couplet that became famous. Well, if you've never heard it before, I guess it's not famous to you. Famous to some people. The couplet was this. How odd of God to choose the Jews. In reply, another writer came up with this verse. But not so odd as those who choose a Jewish God but spurn the Jews. Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah, was born a Jew. And as the replying uh, writer correctly put his finger on the issue, you would be a fool to accept the God who revealed himself through the Jewish people and then hold some kind of animosity or hatred toward the Jews <clears throat> when you are indeed worshiping a Jewish Messiah. No higher honor could possibly have been given to the people of Israel than this. And Paul reminds us that Jesus is not just a man. Because that's what they were looking for. That was one of the great surprises of the New Testament. Everybody was looking for a man to fulfill all these promises. And indeed a man did. But he was more than a man. It was God himself who became a man and chose to be born a Jew. <clears throat> and then he adds that he is blessed over all, excuse me, blessed forever. God over all, blessed forever. What a list. What a list. God poured out abundant blessings and favor on Israel and showed them that he, had, that he had chosen them to be his covenant people. So again, the question must be asked, with all of this that God did for Israel to make them his people, to preserve them as his people, did he fail because now by and large his people are rejecting his messiah and are cut off from him these people who were the special objects of god's favor and affection are now separated from him so how can you say that nothing can separate us from the love of god can i really believe that god will keep me when he wasn't able to keep israel so now we get to paul's answer to the alarming question did god fail the answer is that Israel's apostasy doesn't mean that God has failed. Paul freely admits that Israel was adopted by God and that they are currently alienated from him, refusing to trust his son, Jesus the Messiah. It looks bad for God, God's reputation that he wasn't able to keep his adopted people in his fold. But Paul is about to clear up the situation by showing why Israel's apostasy is not a failure on God's part. Look with me at verses 6 through 9. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For, here's the reason, not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. Not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring, but through Isaac your offspring shall be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said. About this time I will return. Excuse me. About this time next year I will return. And Sarah shall have a son. Has God failed? Absolutely not. It is not as though the word of God has failed. But Paul how can you say that? You admit that God's chosen people are cut off from him. How can you say the word of God hasn't failed? Because not all who are descended from Israel. Belong to Israel. What scripture is saying is that there are two Israels. There is national, ethnic, physical Israel, everyone who is descended from them. And there is true spiritual Israel, everyone who is a true child of God. 
Not everyone who is descended from national Israel belongs to spiritual Israel. Not everyone who is physically an Israelite is spirit. And to illustrate this truth, Paul shows that God never intended for his promises and his covenant to apply to everyone who descended from the patriarchs who were the ones given the promises and covenant. So he points first of all to Abraham's situation. Not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. The first we read of God's promise to Abraham is Genesis 12, and God said this, I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now at that point, as far as Abraham knew, any children he had would be part of this promise. But later in Genesis 21, God makes it clear that the promise and covenant would go through only one child of Abraham's, and that is Isaac. Ishmael was also a child of Abraham, just like Isaac. But God said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. Ishmael did not inherit the promise of God. After Sarah's death, Abraham remarried a woman named Keturah, and he had six more sons. But none of those men inherited the promise and covenant of God. God limited the promise to one particular son of Abraham, the only son of Sarah. And verse 8 tells us that God is establishing a spiritual principle in his choice of Isaac. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. Being a child of God is not something accomplished by natural means. And out of all of Abraham's children, only Isaac's birth was supernatural. Only Isaac's birth required direct divine intervention. And that's why he quotes Genesis 18 and verse 9. For this is what the promise said, about this time next year I will return and Sarah shall have a son. Sarah shall have a son. Sarah, who was too old to have a child, will have a son. God promised a miracle child to Abraham, who alone would be considered Abraham's offspring with respect to the covenant. This means that the children of God are not children of God by natural means, such as ancestry. Children of God are those who are brought into his family supernaturally, the convincing power of the Holy Spirit and the God given and gift of faith in Christ. So no, the word of God has not failed because it was never God's intent to give the blessing and promise and covenant of Abraham to all of Abraham's descendants. As one commentator put it, Israel is only part of Abraham's descendants and the promise was made to Abraham. Therefore, it follows that the present exclusion of the majority of even the race of Israel, excuse me, present exclusion of even the majority of the race of Israel from the inheritance of the promises is not inconsistent with the original or purpose of those promises. Mere physical descent establishes no claim to being the seed of Abraham. Only the child of the promise was counted as Abraham's seed, and only the children of the promise are children of God. Then Paul strengthens his case of vindicating God's actions by bringing up another example from the patriarchs. Look at verses 10 through 13. And not only so, so here's the example of Abraham and Isaac, but let's go farther. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. When the promise was given to Abraham, there was no restriction mentioned. So the fulfillment of the promise might have been through Ishmael as well as through Isaac. Certainly Abraham and Sarah believed that God was carrying, out, carrying his promise to any seed of Abraham. That's why they came up with the foolish idea to have Abraham bear a child with Sarah's handmaid, Hagar. But God later limited that promise to Isaac. However, you could argue, well, of course God chose Isaac because... Ishmael was not actually the child of Abraham's wife. And then these other six sons were not the children of Abraham's first wife. So that's why he goes on to give us the example of Jacob and Esau. <clears throat> Here is a case of two men who were the children of the same father and the same mother. 
Further than that, they were twins born at the same time. And yet God made a distinction between them. Jacob and Esau had the same father and the same mother, both descendants of Isaac. But Esau did not inherit the covenant and the promise that was given to Abraham. Not only did this choice of Jacob over Esau show that receiving an inheritance with the people of God isn't based on physical descent. It also showed that it isn't based on behavior. Paul points out that God's choice was made when Jacob and Esau were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad. Theologian James Denny summarized the situation this way. The choice is made before they were born, so it wasn't on the basis of their behavior or their accomplishments. God didn't take into account the lives that they would live. The only possible ground, humanly speaking, for preferring one brother over another would be birth order. And God disregarded that as well. He chose Jacob, who was the second one born. So why did God do it this way? Why did God choose Jacob over Esau? What was his choice based on? The word says that God chose Jacob over Esau in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. Now that's a, a strange phrase. What does it mean that God's purpose of election might continue? Election refers to an act of choice. The New Bible Dictionary defines the biblical use of the term this way. The act of choice whereby God picks an individual or group out of a larger company for a purpose or destiny of his own appointment. For instance, Israel was elected to be his people. Out of all the nations of the earth, God chose and elected Israel. God's choice of Jacob over Esau was made to show God's freedom to choose people to privileges for his own purpose and not on the ground of any human claims. It is an awesome display of God's sovereignty. Not because of works, adds, Paul's, but because, as adds Paul, but because of him who calls. Participating in the covenant and promises of God depends on God. The determining factor in inheriting the covenant and promises of God is God. It is not based on human birth. It is not based on behavior. And Paul says that was the case right from the beginning. So the fact that most of physical Israel is now separated from God doesn't mean that God has failed. True Israel has not been cut off from God because true Israel doesn't include everyone who is physically Israelite. And ultimately, anyone's participation in God's promises depends on God's choice. Prophet Jonah said, salvation belongs to the Lord. Salvation belongs to Yahweh. He is the author and the finisher of your faith. This section ends with one more Old Testament reference in verse 13. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Now Paul is still showing that God chose Jacob over Esau with this quote from Malachi chapter 1. And Malachi was referring to the state of the nations that had descended from these two men. But it underscores the weight of God's choice between the twins. Not only did Esau not receive the covenant, but his descendants were also outside the people of God. Let me just pause here before I move on. Any of Esau's descendants could have joined themselves to the people of God by putting their faith in God. You guys have all heard of Ruth. She was not a descendant of Israel naturally. She was a pagan woman. But because she placed her faith in God and joined herself to her people, she was also adopted into the people of God. <clears throat> Let me just say one more word about this hate-love thing because it sounds so uh, jarringly unjust. God is not saying that he hate, hated Esau in the sense of desiring his instruction. His, I'll catch it in a second. Desiring his destruction. He's saying that in contrast to the favor shown to Jacob, Esau is hated. For instance, in Luke 14, 26, Jesus said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Jesus was not literally telling his disciples to hate their families since Jesus also said that the second greatest commandment was to love your neighbor as yourself, which would, of course, include your family. What he is saying that our love for him, Jesus, should surpass and exceed our love for anyone and anything else. Therefore, comparatively, it is as if we love Jesus and hate these others. So that's the way Paul, excuse me, that God is talking about Jacob and Esau here. Because he has given his favor and his covenant and his promises to Jacob, it is as if he is saying, 
I loved Jacob and I loved Esau less. I gave him less privileges. I gave him less of my favor. <clears throat> it may still sound unfair, but I hope it at least takes the edge off the hate part. The word of God has not failed because Israel rejected Christ. God has not lost Israel because there's a difference between physical Israel and spiritual Israel. Israel, the physical people, are only the children of God if they become children of promise by trusting in the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. In other words, they must believe in order to be saved and brought into the family of God. Now, the main point of this passage is that God's word hasn't failed, even though most of Israel is cut off from him. But I want to focus in on the secondary point. The answer to the question, if God has failed Israel, am I really secure in God's love in Christ? And to put it very simply, you are safe in Christ. God didn't fail his people Israel, and God will not fail you. Yahweh is the God who cannot fail. All wisdom, power, and authority belong to him. Just like the Israelites, you are not saved by your physical lineage, and you are not saved by your behavior. And by the way, this passage contains a warning within it as well. <clears throat> living under the blessings of God, living, uh, even experiencing the blessings of God, <clears throat> pardon me, being part of the visible people of God, does not make you part of the true family of God. Everyone who was part of Israel during the time of Moses saw the miraculous plagues by which they were delivered from Egypt. They walked with the rest of the Israelites, freed from slavery out of Egypt, even given gifts by the people of Egypt without having to raise a hand in battle or rebellion. They saw the Red Sea parted. They walked on dry ground as the waters were piled up on either side of them. They saw the miraculous giving of the law. They saw God's manifestation on Mount Sinai. And most of them rejected God. Hebrews chapter 4 says the reason that they did not enter into God's rest. In other words, the reasons that they were not brought into God's family is because they did not unite to God's people through faith. They did not put their trust in God. So being part of the vis visible family of God, such as Fellowship Bible Church, even being a member a fellowship Bible church does not make you part of the family of God. It is trusting in the Son of God and thereby becoming a child of the promise. And if you have believed in Christ, you can rest. 1 Peter 1.5 says that you are being guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. God is invincible and his plans are unstoppable. You are safe in Christ. I've come up with a few ways that you can respond to this passage. I want to focus in on uh, just one of them. The second one up there. Look for an opportunity to explain salvation to someone. <clears throat> and what I mean is this. Look for an opportunity to emphasize the truth that we are not saved by being born into a Christian family. We are not saved by being good boys and girls. We are saved purely by faith in the living Christ. You can talk to your child about it one night before bed. Talk to a Christian co-worker about it while you're at lunch. Look for an opportunity, pray for an opportunity to talk to an unbeliever about the truth of God's free and merciful salvation. Let's all stand and go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, in the name of your Son, who is God over all, forever blessed. In the name of your Son, who is the Messiah, who is the fulfillment of all the covenants and promises and prophecies of the Old Testament, who is the culmination of your revelation and the channel of your redemption and grace. In his name we come before you, Lord, and we celebrate and we glory in what you have done for us, in who you are, in your greatness, and the free, glorious mercy you offer to each and every one of us. We praise you, Lord, that salvation is not based upon being born into the right family. It is not based upon doing the right things or having good behavior. It is based upon trusting in your son, the one who paid the price for our salvation, the one who rose victorious from the dead and now reigns forevermore.
God, I pray for your glorious grace over everyone who is gathered here this morning, everyone who is watching this service online. I pray that if they don't know you, that your spirit would bring to mind the reality of their state, that they are living under your wrath, but that you are offering them grace, forgiveness, and eternal life if they would just believe in your son. And God, for all the believers that are joining in, I pray that you would re-encourage them, reignite their love for you, reestablish them in their faith in you. Manifest your life through us, God. Bring glory to your name this week. In your holy name I pray, amen. God bless you, my friends. Have a great week.